This is Commodore Sadid Malik. I'm the Chief Executive Officer and Secretary General of Karachi Council on Foreign Relations. You all are very well introduced to Karachi Council on Foreign Relations. We keep, we have been holding on seminars and after COVID webinars. And today's topic is uh, PAC, European Union Relations. There could not be anyone better than the Ambassador of European Union, Her Excellency Andrula Kaminara, to tell us about it. And there could be no better than person, our Ambassador Mustafa Kamal Kazi, who has been Ambassador to a number of uh, European countries that included Russia, Netherlands, and also to Iraq and Indonesia. Concurrently, he has represented Pakistan in a number of international organizations for uh, prevention of chemical weapons, UNESCO, etc. In today's webinar, kindly remain all participants, kindly remain muted till the time the moderator, Ambassador Kazi Mustafa Kamal Kazi, uh, asks the person to unmute himself. May I now request Ambassador Mustafa Kamal Kazi to moderate today's webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are indeed honored to have with us Ambassador Androla Kaminara, Ambassador of the European Union. She took up her assignment in Pakistan in September 2019. She has remarkable career profile. Before her assignment in Pakistan, Ambassador Kaminara has held senior positions in the European Commission, looking after its humanitarian aid operations and international cooperation and development programs. She has also served as the head of European Commission representation in Cyprus. She has been European Union Fellow at the European Union Studies Center at Oxford University. Before joining European Commission, Ambassador Kaminara was special advisor to two cabinet ministers in her country, the Greece. We are very pleasant, uh, pleased to welcome you, Ambassador Kaminara, to the Karachi Council for Foreign Relations. Next time, we hope to have you with us in person in Karachi sometimes in future. We'll start with your briefing on EU-Pakistan uh, relations and perhaps EU's global role followed by Q&A. But before I pass on the floor to you, I would like to highlight how much we in Pakistan value and cherish outstanding multifaceted relationship, uh, relationship with the European Union and bilaterally with all its member states. Trade remains an important feature of Pakistan's relations with EU. Pakistan is used GSP plus facility. The EU is Pakistan's first or second most important trading partner, depending which sides figures you rely on. It accounted for more than 14% of Pakistan's total trade in 2020 and absorbing 28% of Pakistan's total exports. The European Union has provided more than 1.3 billion euros for projects and programs in Pakistan. Since the grant of GSP Plus in 2014, Pakistan's export to European Union have enhanced from 4.5 billion euros in 2013 to 7.4 billion euros in 2019, registering increase of 65%, which is a quite a quite a large number figure. So naturally, the resolution adopted by the European Parliament last year, recommending withdrawal of Pakistan's GSP plus status on human rights grounds, has caused us considerable concern. Since Karachi Council for 
foreign relations membership includes a sizable number of businessmen, your views on future prospects of GSP scheme would be of considerable interest to us. Secondly, European Union's geographical proximity and long-standing historical ties with Asia and Africa make it a distinctive player in the international system. As the largest donor of development assistance in the world, it has inherent strategic advantage to play a constructive balancing role in an increasing polarized multipolar global dispensation we see today. We would therefore be interested to know how EU is looking at its global role, particularly in the context of situation in our region and beyond. With these remarks, I pass on the floor to you, Ambassador. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Kamal. Thank you very much, Mr. Sadiq. Uh, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to uh, be addressing you today. I do look forward to uh, a potential future meeting face to face. Uh, it's important um, to also have uh, you know, the face to face meetings and not just the uh, Zooms. Or which have become part of our lives recently, but nonetheless, we're doing the best we can in the current context. Uh, and thank you for um, also presenting uh, not only uh, my uh, career, but also uh, presenting what you would like to focus more in this um, presentation. I have uh, Prepare some slides uh, depend and on the basis of what you have said you are more interested in. I would uh, go slower or faster in, in the presentation. Um, my presentation basically has two parts. One is uh, more focused on what is the, what part one is what is, what is the European Union? What are our um, aims? What are our um, objectives? And then look into um, what is the uh, European Union uh, doing in Pakistan? Because I think you have to, have the, the general uh, before you go into the specific. So um, this is moral, this is uh, the um, structure we will have today, but just keep in mind there will be two parts, one the general of the EU and one which would, uh, the second part will focus on Pakistan alone. So um, the, the European Union, it's a unique economic and political union, 27 uh, member states. Of course, we lost the UK um, after Brexit. Um, the very first steps uh, of the European Union uh, started after Second World War. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind the uh, logic of creating a union between former enemies in Europe and former um, enemies that fought two uh, world wars and uh, where so many uh, lives were lost is, is absolutely fundamental to um, what the European Union is doing both internally and also what the European Union is trying to uh, project throughout the world, which is cooperation rather than, um, let's say, um, aggression, uh, uh, cooperating with, uh, cooperation can only give benefits to uh, both sides. Um, uh, let's let, I mean, think the Good rest uh, you would know. Uh, the, the goals and the values. You have a message for you. Uh, I think somebody has not muted their um, their uh, microphone. I continue. So, uh, what are the goals uh, of the European Union? And as I've just hinted at, is first and foremost is to promote peace, both within and outside the uh, the European Union and in, in in the world. Is to establish economic and monetary uh, system to promote inclusion and combat discrimination. Uh, break down barriers to trade and borders. That's why we have the common um, the common market. Encourage technological and scientific developments. Uh, promote and this is uh, something that over the the recent the last let's say ten years has become even uh, more important to promote and champion environmental protection um, and to promote goals like the competitive global market and social progress. Our values. 
human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, rule of law, and human rights. And that we practice both internally and externally. And, um, and uh, we can go into uh, details uh, further down on what exactly, how we practice these values. Um, it's a complex set of institutions and uh, bodies, but um, I would say the, the most, um, the core institutions are the European Council, um, representing the um, member states' governments, the European Parliament, which are, uh, represents the citizens of the um, EU, uh, European Commission, which is, let's say, in a simple uh, way, the machinery behind uh, or the new legislation of the EU, the Council of the European Union, which are which meets uh, in the format of specific uh, ministers from all the um, member states. For example, there is an agricultural council. There is a council of foreign uh, foreign ministers, and to that uh, we have the Court of Justice, the European Central Bank, the European Court of Auditors, and a series of other bodies which are important, but um, for the purposes of uh, being in brief, I will uh, leave it at that. Now, uh, which is the leadership? Uh, we have Charles, Charles Michel, who is the president of the European Council. So uh, he chairs the meetings with the uh, heads of state of the 27 member states. The, the, for the first time, we currently have a woman Ursula von der Leyen, president of the European Commission. For the first time also, we have um, not the first woman president of the European Parliament, but the first time that we have both in a woman. And we have also um, HRVP, high rep representative and vice president of the European Commission, uh, Joseph Borrell, who uh, is also the um, the head of the external action service uh, where all delegations and, um, throughout the world uh, report to. The competences. Uh, this is also very important to understand, although it's, it's quite a, a complex system. There are certain areas where uh, it is an exclusive competence of the European Union. So, for example, trade uh, and um, commercial uh, common commercial policies and exclusive competence of the EU. That is why all member states, um, uh, so that is why member states do not have bilateral trade agreements, but uh, all member state uh, trade agreements are under the EU umbrella. In fact, when the uh, UK, after the Brexit, after the UK left, the UK is, is uh, basically moved away from about 100 uh, bilateral uh, trade agreements, uh, which the UK was part of because it was a member of the European Union. And now the UK is trying to uh, renegotiate those trade agreements. Certain topics are under shared competences like uh, protection or energy of public health. Uh, there are competences where the EU can take actions uh, to supplement the actions of the member states and certain things are uh, the competence of the member states, uh, employment and social policies, for example, are the competences for, of the um, member state. So there's, there is a complex system of who does what, but there's also the logic behind it that uh, decisions are taken at the lowest a possible level to make them efficient. So that's uh, also the principle of such. Um, each um, financial um, cycle, we have uh, concrete priorities. Uh, we have a seven, we work on seven year budgets. So we're currently on the budget uh, um, seven year cycle of 2019, 2024. And uh, you see here, what are the um, priorities, the Green Deal, that the economy works for everybody, um, that uh, the European, um, Europe is fit for the digital age. That means that we empower people in, uh, in Europe for new 
generation of technologies, promoting the European way of life, which I underline here, the European way of life is the is one that does not only look at, let's say, the Christian way of life or the non-Christian way of life, but looks at every culture that is currently uh, in every um, um, the plethora of the different ways of life that exist in Europe, and we actually um, celebrate that. Let me just say on that that there are 23 million Muslims uh, living in the European uh, Union, and they are very much valued and part of what the European way of life is. Um, we promote a stronger Europe in the world, and we also uh, promote uh, democracy both internally and externally in the European Union. Um, promoting the, um, the protection of the uh, reduction of CO2 emissions is very much um, core to the priority, current priorities of the um, EU. I just like to say that the EU has um, has uh, already declared that by 2030, it is committing to uh, cutting emissions by at least 55%. Uh, we are at the for forefront of um, of protection, of taking action to protect the environment, and uh, that is not only important for us, but I think for the whole world. And we um, protection of the environment is very much one of the areas we discuss with all our partners throughout the world. Um, I've included this slide, which is um, refers to uh, recent developments in the EU with respect to uh, a recent policy objective of the EU, which is to create the strategic uh, compass. Um, I have to uh, say that this is um, something that has been evolving over the years, but has been uh, uh, the push for a strategic compass has also um, been accelerated recently following um, re um, a lot of international events, including what happened in, um, in Afghanistan. Um, the language that we're using vis-a-vis -vis the strategic compass is pretty bold. Um, basically, we have, a, we have um, realized that in order to, be, um, to, to have a strategic relevance, we have to take some actions in order to have capabilities, EU capabilities in addressing some of these the international uh, challenges. Um, there was a risk that we would, if we didn't take these actions, that we would always be principled, but uh, in the wrong run, we would probably seldom be relevant because things, coordination with others across the world for uh, actions to take place would uh, normally mean that it, we react slower than we should. Uh, just a few figures to um, explain what's the logic behind that. Um, few, a few decades ago, the EU was about one quarter, uh, the EU uh, economy was represented about one quarter of the world's um, GDP. In 20 years, we are expected to represent about 10% of the world's GDP. Europe has also been uh, uh, experiencing low uh, birth rates. So uh, by the end of this century, we're expected to be about 5% of the global uh, um, population. So it, it, is, it is necessary to work together on the four areas that you see here. On the one hand, to, um, to in, uh, increase the partnerships that we have with global uh, major players um, from uh, what the EU does with the, with the UN, but also with NATO. Um, also, it is important that we have better capabilities for crisis management. I think also the what has happened with the COVID um, the last few years has put on the agenda the need to have better coordination when major crises happen in the world, um, both internally and externally, for the EU to independently 
be able to respond. We need to ensure that we are more resilient and our own uh, security um, capabilities. We have capabilities for the EU to, um, to react independently to world uh, events. We have a common foreign security policy. Um, it is based on the UN uh, charters. Uh, we believe in non-proliferation and disarmament. And we have, um, and, and I think this is not widely known, that we have 10 EU common security and defense policy civilian missions, both in Europe, in Africa, and the Middle East, and over 2,000 personnel that uh, have been involved in these missions over the last years. This is a quick map of all these um, CSDP missions. One that is of particular relevance to um, Pakistan is the Atalanta mission. You would see it off the coast of uh, uh, the east coast of Africa. Basically, uh, it's a mission that was started in order to ensure that WFP, which is the World Food Program, could deliver aid to Somalia and those ships could be protected from piracy. Um, there has recently been discussions with Pakistan, Pakistan potentially joining the, uh, in this. Uh, you see other countries, um, including uh, Central Africa Republic, uh, in the Sahel, in Mali and uh, Niger, and in other parts of the world. Now, this is a quote from uh, my boss, in a way. Uh, he, is my, he is the boss of every ambassador in the world, uh, Joseph Borrell, uh, who says that our missions and operations are invaluable pillar of European security and defense. Their work on the ground and across continents is the tangible example of the EU action of, of global security. Uh, just uh, another piece of information, in December 2021, uh, Foreign Minister Qureshi was in, in Brussels and he had a very um, long and successful uh, meeting and dinner with uh, um, HRVP for help. Of course, um, the, the currency that most member states are using, 19 EU member states are using the euro, which recently celebrated uh, 20 years since its uh, launching. And this is quite an amazing um, initiative of the EU. Uh, I do remember uh, when the euro was going to be launched, discussions about would it be successful, would it be possible to have one currency? Well, 20 years down the line, you see the figures um, here. Uh, these are the second, the euro is the second most important currency in the world, despite the fact of what I was saying, our population is um, about 10% of the uh, world population, despite the fact that potentially our economy is, um, is somewhere between uh, less than 20% of the world economy currently. So this is one of the very successful projects and initiatives of the EU. Uh, EU and NATO, if we're talking about um, partnerships with others, uh, it's important also to see here that certain EU member states are uh, just uh, members, they're not members of NATO, some are both members of NATO and um, and um, you see the, the UK appears as, uh, sorry, no, it's correct, that uh, the UK is, is a NATO member, but not a member of the EU. Of course, this is a map that needs to be updated. And some member states are both members of the EU and, of course, members of uh, NATO. So uh, this is the first part of my uh, presentation on the um, general context of uh, um, what is the EU. And, in, and now let me quickly go into um, EU Pakistan and what we're doing here because I'd like to give time for um, uh, questions. Um, just to say that this year we're celebrating 60 years of diplomatic relations with the um, with Pakistan. We're in the process of launching a number of activities to celebrate that. 
this is timeline of uh, the EU uh, relations. I, I think uh, notable um, points in this timeline is 2014 when the EU grants uh, GSP plus status to Pakistan and also 2019, summer 2019, when uh, the EU and Pakistan signed the strategic engagement plan. It was signed by Foreign Minister Qureshi and the then uh, HRVP, uh, Frederica Mongeri, this took place in, in Brussels. Now, uh, this strategic engagement plan is for the first time put everything that we do between EU and Pakistan under one umbrella. This document um, included all the previous cooperation areas between EU and Pakistan, but also introduced new ones. So on the top line, you will see the things we were doing before 2019, peace and security. We were always uh, cooperating on democracy, rule of law, on migration, trade, and sustainable development. The document also introduced things like cooperation, education, and culture, science and technology, uh, new dialogue framework for our security, climate change, and renewable energy. Um, in the context, we also have uh, EU-Pakistan uh, military to military cooperation. Um, the EU has and Pakistan have staff talks. The last one was uh, took place in the end of September. And as I mentioned before, you see here that there is discussions on a possible cooperation between um, Pakistan and uh, uh, by Pakistan in the operation at Alam. We also work with Pakistan on issues of counterterrorism, on non-proliferation, um, and these are ongoing um, activities. Uh, we have um, been observers in the uh, elections in 2002, 2008, 2013, and 2018. Uh, this is a very important um, aspect of what we do with uh, Pakistan and um, each time that we we participate in election observations we also um, draft a report which says that on, on the basis of the experience of the previous election of monitoring um, a series of improvements have to take place uh, in the country concerned and there's always a midterm um, mission between the the election observation in the next elections, where um, observers come here to see uh, the progress of those, um, of those reforms. The remaining shortfalls um, are also uh, talking about the uh, percentage of um, representation of women contesting general elections. There's also issues of um, uh, transparency and also um, reporting by the press, the press on elections. Now, uh, one of the points that you had wanted to focus uh, more on was on GSP+. Some of the figures were mentioned. Um, uh, you have here uh, the uh, overall uh, figures. The EU is the biggest destination of uh, Pakistani products. Um, about what, one third of what you export uh, goes to the EU, uh, just the second destination of the US and third is China. I put it here because um, when you're looking at the total trade and uh, Mr. Kamal very, very um, correctly identified this issue, when we're talking about total trade, we are second. But the part of the trade equation that benefits Pakistan is the part benefits mostly Pakistan is the part of Pakistani goods getting to the EU. And uh, there we are by, uh, by far the, the biggest destination. Uh, here you see uh, the evolution of the um, exports from Pakistan uh, since uh, 2014 when we uh, uh, when GSP plus was granted to uh, Pakistan. Of course, he had a, a slight dip in um, uh, last year when he was in 2020, sorry, when, due to uh, COVID, but I have to uh, congratulate Pakistan because in 2021, uh, the 
exporters, very, or Pakistani exporters, very quickly managed to uh, turn their attention to markets that were uh, not being um, markets that other countries used to uh, cover and actually pick up a lot of the, uh, not only pick up what the dip in the exports due to COVID, but increase the, the share of exports um, even further. What is uh, GSP plus? I assume most people would know, but I just want to focus on the four core areas or obligations towards uh, GSP plus, which are human rights, labor rights, environment, and uh, governance. There was also mention about the resolution that passed, um, the European Parliament passed in uh, end of April last year. Um, and I, let me say a few things about that resolution. First, that the resolution went to the plenary of the European Parliament uh, because it was mainly focusing on uh, two individuals that were in um, in jail uh, on blasphemy um, charges, which were um, trying to get their uh, case heard as at an appeal court. I think since 2014, if my memory. Um, certainly right. What the, that resolution of the parliament in April said is that um, these two people uh, should, I mean, the um, the courts should at least hear their, uh, their appeals and um, um, on the basis of what the court decides, uh, there should be uh, decisions, decisions made. But in the process of that resolution being tabled, other provisions were added to the resolution. Uh, Ambassador Kamal was very correct that there was a paragraph added to the resolution which said that we call on the Commission because it's um, European Commission um, competence to draft reports on the progress of GSP plus of a particular uh, country. Uh, it called on the European Commission to assess, I think there is even the word critically, of the progress of Pakistan on implementation of the human on the uh, GSP plus obligation, and uh, if these um, obligations were not met, that uh, it should consider withdrawing the uh, GSP plus status. Um, where are we now with respect to uh, this? We there have been um, a number of preliminary exchanges of data between uh, in the e European Commission requesting and Pakistan uh, responding and providing data on what progress, where we are on these um, four core areas of obligations. Um, so all of this has been happening since the summer uh, to um, currently. There were uh, exchanges of uh, notes about um, uh, clarifications about the data provided. And we're now waiting for uh, an expert mission to come to Pakistan, hopefully in the next month, uh, where they would meet uh, people uh, in order to get uh, as full a picture on the implementation of the GSB plus obligations as possible, on the basis of which there will be a new report, uh, part of the um, obligations, uh, um, to, to draft a, a report on progress made by each country every two years. So the, the idea is that there will be a mission hopefully next month that would uh, uh, pro get all the data they will need to draft such a report. Uh, the process after that is that the report is, um, it's produced by the European Commission, it's tabled in the European Parliament and the European Council. Uh, if they agree on how to proceed, uh, fine. If not, there's trilogue uh, discussions, which means that the three institutions are uh, um, have negotiations, and then there is a decision on what next. One other thing to highlight vis-a-vis -vis GSP Plus is that the current uh, legislation, not just for Pakistan, but for every country in the world, basically um, has a guillotine date, which is the December, 2023. When we uh, 
um, introduce legislation in the EU, we normally have that legislation being implemented over a finite time period. And at the end of that finite time period, there is a, a, an assessment. Did we achieve the results that we required with that legislation? Uh, and uh, do we need to change anything? And then there are decisions about continuation of that um, trade regime or, or not. So um, the European Commission has already tabled its suggestion on what the new phase of uh, GSP Plus um, should look like. Um, the European Parliament has, ta has already uh, tabled some suggestions for changes to that proposal. Uh, and over the next uh, three or four months, we expect that there will be um, an EU position on what the next generation of GSP Plus uh, would look like. Uh, you can imagine it as GSP Plus version two. One thing that is not that for a country to be able to um, uh, to have benefit from a GSP Plus version two, it has to reapply. There's no automatic um, transfer of a country from the current regime to the potential new regime. So that is something that uh, Pakistan will need to do uh, for the future. I, I took a longer time on this slide since you were very interested in in, in uh, finding more. I, I will uh, just use this as my final slide to give time for um, um, questions, questions and answers. Um, just to say that apart from all the other things that we're doing, we're also um, very much um, involved in providing development cooperation funds to Pakistan. We have been um, providing about 100 million euros of grants. Uh, I underline it's grants and not loans. What we do um, here it is does not come with, um, it's not in the form of a, of a loan. It's European taxpayers' money that goes into um, providing and addressing needs in third countries and trying to uh, support the faster development of third countries, including uh, Pakistan. This we do in um, this uh, development cooperation. We do um, in a seven year plan, as if you remember earlier, I was saying that the budget of the European Union is decided on a seven year um, basis. Within that budget, there is a part which is for development uh, cooperation. And for each country, there is a multi-annual indicative program uh, which is defined. Um, so uh, we are in the process of now uh, starting the next um, the next cycle. We've already defined with the government what are the priority areas um, and what we'll be doing. In a nutshell, for the future, we'll be looking into um, sustainable uh, green growth. We will be looking into providing support for um, um, vocational training and education. And also there is part of the funds that will go into supporting things like the rule of law. I have uh, more detailed slides on all of these things, but I think it's better if I, if I, if I leave it here and then allow for questions. So um, overall, what the EU is and what are the key things we have been doing uh, in Pakistan. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, and we, are very, we really appreciate your clarification regarding the GSP Plus program, uh, particularly in the light of the resolution that was passed in the European Parliament. Uh, we hope now that the next 10 year cycle, which is due for Pakistan, uh, the review cycle of GSP uh, in two th next year, uh, will be will be as sympathetic as it is it has as, as, the, as the EU approach has been in the past because for us uh, you know uh, the situation as you know very well that uh, we the COVID and other factors have uh, put us in a very straight uh, uh, sort of a, a difficult economic uh, situation with regard to our exports and uh, the continuation of uh, the uh, EU uh, the GSP plus to the next uh, 10 year cycle 
uh, it will be will be of a great relief to Pakistan. Uh, 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 and on the context of uh, EU's uh, uh, global role, I have a question. Uh, there seems to be some contradiction in uh, EU's global role. On one hand, we see emphasis within the EU on an assertive foreign policy, common security and defense policy. And on the other hand, there is an urge to quickly fall in line with the US-led positions on regional and global issues or crisis, even though those positions may not may not be always in the interest of some key EU countries, uh, member states. Uh, I would, I mean, you know, to just mention the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, gas that imports from Russia, uh, China, uh, U.S. contest, and also the approach to the uh, humanitarian situation in uh, Afghanistan. So, would you be kind enough to elaborate and to address this uh, kind of, a, I mean, impression and perception that prevails? Uh, thank you, very, very pertinent and also um, timely, I would say, uh, question. Um, the reason I, I, I paused and I think I went into a bit of detail when I was talking about the strategic compass for the EU is exactly uh, um, that in the current uh, geostrategic um, situation, it is quite obvious that uh, the EU needs to strive for more independent uh, action and to have the capabilities to take more independent action. It is, if you look at the, um, the address of the uh, Commission President to the European Parliament, uh, once a year there is a State of the Union address which the, commi uh, the Commission President makes to the European Parliament and it takes place in September. If you look at what uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said in that context, it was, uh, it was in September and the events in uh, Afghanistan um, and, uh, took place in August. And uh, she does not shy away from the fact that um, we, we needed to have been able to act more independent in the situation in Afghanistan. And a lot of the, uh, let's say, the rapid push that has taken place to promote this strategic um, um, compass for the EU is exactly the realization that um, we, of course, cooperate with uh, with NATO, with the US, or or other um, global bodies or global um, partners. But in order for us to be uh, to um, have a more strategic um, position, we also need to have our own capabilities. So uh, that's the one fact. The other fact, if we look at now what is happening vis-a-vis -vis the situation with, uh, between Russia, uh, it is um, when the first, uh, when the situation first, let's say, hit the, the international news, uh, we were not, the European Union was not very much uh, in the picture. And the European uh, Union and HRVB Borrell was adamant that there would be no discussion about security in Europe without the European Union at the table. So uh, um, they, you have highlighted, let's say, a number of things that uh, in the past were um, not allowing us to be uh, as relevant as we would have liked. And that's where this uh, new strategy, the strategic compass comes uh, uh, on the table now with very much uh, let's say, support from a lot of the member states in order exactly to address those, let's say, weaknesses that we have publicly identified. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, now we'll move on to Komodo Sidit. Uh, if there are any questions from uh, from uh, participants uh, uh, I, from the audience. Uh, There's one question about the touristic destinations of Pakistan. And we have uh, very few tourists coming from there, while we have excellent tourist attractions in Pakistan. 
I'm the first lover of the touristic attractions in Pakistan. I'm I'm a I'm a great believer on the touristic um, possibilities for Pakistan. Uh, and uh, the European Union also has been providing, in some cases, uh, some grants in order to further promote areas. Um, we have done. Uh, we have contributed to providing, for example, um, um, books or references or uh, online material that would mm -hmm. make touristic destinations in in Pakistan more known. But we also have to uh, consider um, another aspect. When, um, as, as ambassador, I, I mean, the EU ambassador, of course, has no EU citizens because we have here the ambassadors of the, uh, also the, uh, of the member states. We have 17 ambassadors of EU member states, as well as myself as the EU ambassador, I chair the coordination meeting between um, or the EU ambassadors in Pakistan. But uh, let's say um, in certain parts of the country, ambassadors cannot go without NOCs, non-objection. In, in some cases, there is a reluctance. Uh, and I'm not talking about just the EU ambassadors, I'm talking about all ambassadors. There is a reluctance to um, recommend that people come because the, the role one of the roles of the of, an, of, uh, of a member of, of a country ambassador is also to take care of its own citizens if something goes wrong, and in order to get uh, access to the areas where the tourists go, the ambassadors cannot go. So I think uh, this is something that Pakistan needs to consider. Um, this can go you. to uh, some uh, remote areas. Yet so there is a cultural interaction ultimately leads to uh, increase of uh, trader uh, transactions. There's a suggestion which has come up in the chat that uh, would it be possible to make some sister countries between uh, European capitals and uh, Pakistani cities like uh, Lahore and Karachi? Uh, this, uh, of course, this is possible. This has come up. Um, and I, uh, uh, as a suggestion in the past, we can always do that. The question is um, to ensure the action we take will actually lead to more tourism. Uh, and uh, I think the, the key to having more tourism is more integrated touristic product. So, um, uh, and secondly, to, to be able to, um, access the country uh, more free. I'll, I'll give you an example of what I mean by integrated touristic uh, product. In, I've been to some areas which are stunning beauty. I mean, really, um, the world should see a lot more of these places in Pakistan. But you travel there and let's say you go to, to the north, you travel there, you go if, you, if you're interested in mountain climbing. You, you can do that. But normally when tourists travel, they don't just travel to do one activity. They will need to do some cultural activities. They will need some, uh, let's say, um, restaurants and, and uh, you know, the transport system has to be better. A lot of tourists are also very interested now in having ecological tourism, tourism that uh, does not um, Put a further burden on on the environment, but that they would come and see um, places that are pristine, and that their presence there would not cause any problem. And those types of things, I think, uh, I've seen that there has been improvement. But I think uh, maybe further work on those needs to take place. Another example I can also give is Pakistan. I think has five World Heritage sites. One goes there, and there are stunning uh, if one goes there they are not the normal service the, uh, the normal service that as a tourist you would expect do not exist in the sense of you can't buy a, a guidebook you can't buy certain souvenirs you go to the site there's no linked touristic support there meaning restaurants or hotels or things like that so so huge touristic potential remains 
and um, and explore. Yes, Mr. Abu Bakr Shamsi has raised his hand, and if you permit, sir, uh, maybe but ask him do. briefly. Very be very brief, brief, uh, Mr. Abu Bakr. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Abu Bakr Shamsi from the Karachi Chamber of Commerce. I just had a very quick question that. Uh, since we represent the largest chamber of Pakistan, which is basically the seventh largest chamber in the world, mm -hmm. a major question that uh, most of our businessmen have is the duration of the visa that is issued to them. It is really not conducive to a good working business environment that after every three months or four months, they have to reapply for visas. So my suggestion would be that EU uh, come up with a better uh, visa scheme, something like the US has come up. Uh, almost all of our members get a five-year multiple entry visa every time they apply from the U.S. And that seems a much better idea and a much better, uh, much more conducive to the working environment of businesses. Um, I hear the request loud and clear. Uh, one of the slides that I had skipped was the EU-Pakistan uh, readmission agreement. What we do on, on, on visas is, is uh, the result of a bilateral agreement. We have annual uh, discussions between Pakistan and uh, um, and the EU about this uh, readmission agreement, and tied to that is also uh, the travel between Pakistanis and uh, to Europe and vice versa. This is something that has been um, uh, raised in in a number of other, on a number of other occasions. I have to say that the visa. Issues are a uh, competence of each member state. Uh, we coordinate as the EU, but it's each member state. And I know over the last couple of years, it's been even more difficult because of the COVID um, issues uh, that have been concerned. When, when we do discuss with member states, uh, this issue has come up repeatedly. We're looking at ways of making the ease of uh, travel with, of business people from here to the EU and, and vice versa, because there's also uh, problems uh, of you. Europeans uh, coming here. So um, it will be the last question from Mr. Sharik Wora, one of our members of KCFR. Mr. Sharik Wora, please uh, make a very short question. We are running out of the time. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Her Excellency. I know you visited Karachi Chamber last year where we interacted with you. Uh, yes. My question, uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, during your uh, presentation, you mentioned that there will be version 2 for GSP Plus in the next 3-4 months. That means uh, uh, you will be coming with a new restrictions and new facilitations for GSP Plus. And would that version 2 will be shared uh, with the private sector? So if there are any challenges for that, we can respond. This is my uh, first uh, question. And my second question, Her Excellency, is that uh, uh, for us, exports to European Union is really very important. But side by side, I know uh, for sure that Pakistan was one of the biggest buyers of textile machinery uh, during the last two years from European Union, probably uh, the top three buyers of uh, European machinery. So, not that Pakistan through their export is helping, but we have bought a lot of machinery from the European Union also. Absolutely. So, uh, you uh, and the European Union uh, member states should also appreciate Pakistan's uh, uh, effort for balance of trade. Thank you. I'll start with the second uh, question. Of course, the GSP Plus is a it's not a one-way trade regime, it's a two-way trade regime. So uh, Pakistan has managed to increase its exports to the EU, 65% since it was signed. The EU uh, increased also its exports to Pakistan, but I think it's 48%, if I remember correctly. So uh, absolutely, uh, the GSP Plus is a two-way regime, trade regime. You have to also know that uh, granting zero import textiles into the EU sometimes has made them cheaper than textiles um, which have been produced in the EU. So basically, uh, sometimes Pakistan, Pakistani ex, um, textiles are uh, find a bigger market in the EU than EU produced textiles and that is something that has to be borne in mind 
in uh, when uh, when somebody is discussing about what's the next generation and why should they you uh, have, um, continue or not continue the GSP plus uh, regime. Uh, so that's as a background. Um, on the three months, I think there was some uh, misunderstanding. According to the GSP uh, regulation, the European Commission every two years has to table uh, a status report, an evaluation of where the country is in implementation of the GSP plus uh, obligations. The last one we tabled uh, was in February 2020. So the next the next report is being, uh, I mean, the process has already started and that's why we will have a mission here, which after the mission, then the drafting um, continues. So um, this report is a technical report. It says, where were we before? Where are we now? Uh, some of the things are not numerical, but I can tell you, uh, for example, um, since had X number of inspectors of factories, I don't know what the number was, 100, it's now 150, or it's now 50. It's facts, and it's facts which are um, uh, received and, and um, very verified, of course, but they're received from the government. So it's not, we don't make any of these uh, things uh, up. And I underline that the previous report that we issued, there was not one, uh, statement or anybody that would say the facts were not correct. So there will be a factual report, progress made, not progress made. And what we're looking at is not for to go from zero to a hundred, but to be on a trajectory of improving. The last report uh, um, said, I'll give you one example. Two reports back, it said that um, Pakistan needs to um, have a National Commission of Human Rights. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are just running out of time as you have given us this one hour and thank you. And may we now request our chairman, Ikram Sagal, for his concluding remarks. Excellency, uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us today. Uh, and uh, it is really, uh, it's been a really privilege to listen to you and uh, to hear a comprehensive uh, um, presentation on the EU-Pakistan uh, diplomatic and economic uh, relationship. I have a few points uh, since, um, you know, first European landed here in 1498, Vasco de Gama. And after that, uh, you know, all the trade has been sea trade, uh, not really the trade by land, which has been uh, there, but not in a very sophisticated manner. Uh, one part of the presentation, which I feel that uh, needs uh, looking at is uh, the two corridors that link up uh, uh, that thing, other than the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Because as you know, uh, the World Economic Forum has included Pakistan in uh, the Eurasia um, uh, sector, other than the MENA sector, the Middle East, North Africa sector. And uh, that is because of the presence of Gwadar on the Indian Ocean. And therefore, other than the China-Pakistan economic corridor, there are two other important corridors. One is the North-South corridor from Russia and the Central Asian states into Gwadar. And the other one mm -hmm. is the uh, corridor, which is the old RCT highway, which really connected uh, the regional property development highway, which connected uh, Pakistan through Iran and Turkey to Europe. And these corridors are very much in existence. They are actually capable of working today. It shortens the distance for trade. It shortens the distance, shortens the economic uh, relationship in the sense of the trade charges become much less. And moreover, it is door to door. So if you put a container in Karachi, you can take off the container in Brussels on Rotterdam, or you can take off the container in in, um, uh, in Barcelona for that matter. So I think that is something that uh, I think would be nice to have discussed more because I think uh, there is a European interest now in, uh, in uh, you know, using this fundamental access to the Indian Ocean, which comes through and uh, which now with, uh, you know, more peace coming to the region in this area, it is a more feasible proposition. 
The other thing, Excellency, which I must point out to you is uh, uh, we, we, I know uh, for certain that the European Union is very interested in financial inclusion, uh, like the World Bank, uh, financial inclusion in the sustainable development goals. And uh, particularly women's empowerment, and women's empowerment. As you know, uh, you know, women do not have access to bank accounts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And a lot of work is going on in Pakistan in this respect. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, uh, I'm sure uh, there is a lot of you have must have studied it, and there is a part of it. So um, uh, I think that is something that needs to be discussed further. Because certainly the European Union, because of your contention to human rights, and this is financial inclusion of women is part of human rights. So I think whatever help that you can give in that respect uh, would be fine. Uh, I would take this opportunity to request a further dialogue with you, um, of course, pending your visit to uh, Karachi. Uh, we keep visiting uh, 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 And so we would like to come and uh, discuss it. Excellency, again, I thank you very much. Uh, it's very kind of you. Actually, I'm um, the Secretary General has dragged me in from Dubai. I'm, sit I'm in Dubai, supposed to come back tonight. But uh, he said, no, you must attend it. And I'm, I am very honored and privileged that we have attended this uh, session. Thank you very much, Excellency.